Uh, next up, we have uh, Jim Kellogg that's going to be talking about monitoring for water quality. Thanks, Jim. Thanks. I'm not exactly sure what buttons I'm going to need to have to push to get going. I could push away here, but you're probably not going to see me talking about water quality. And if somewhere else. Sorry. Yeah, um, and this is just for. You can press the right one to go forward. I'm going to be talking about, thanks, Jim. I'm going to be talking about water quality, primarily concentrating on reference water, waters. Um, the topic is sentinel streams, which we've been looking at for climate change since, uh, for about 10 years now, and the long-term acid lake monitoring program, that's called the LTM program. Uh, these water bodies have a lot in common because they're pretty much reference waters. Those waters that aren't being impacted or impaired by uh, activities beyond atmospheric deposition uh, and, and, and minimally affected. Oh, excuse me. I haven't talked to a group as big as this in maybe since, uh, well, I don't know, 20 years? <laughs> I haven't talked to a group in 20 years either, so. <laughs> Here goes ten, two minutes. Anyway, let's get off the first slide. <laughs> and, and how do I go to the next slide? Just push. Right, arrow. right arrow? Okay. Oh, great. All right, so I won't spend too much time on the talking ones, but what I do want to do is present some trends. We've been, we've been doing this project, the LTM, Acid Lake Program, since 1980, and I think that's long enough to actually d develop some trends. It's great to follow up after Rich because a lot of what's driving these lakes are uh, atmospheric, for sure, and particularly the Clean Air Act that was passed in 1992. A lot of, uh, a lot of initially, our time was spent developing those trends where things really weren't happening that much. Uh, also, I do want to talk about the Sentinel Stream monitoring. A lot of our lakes are absolutely beautiful lakes. This is Born Pond which is a VMC core area and sits in the middle of a uh, Lybrook wilderness. This is the first time I've seen these graphs. Uh, big, <laughs> my God, that's wonderful. Very visible, but what you can see is that, I need a, like a microphone or something. What you can see is that uh, the lakes are responding to change, responding to trends, and a lot of them are directly related to clean air legislation. Um, if you see a line, that means we've got a, a positive trend. If I don't have a line, it means there's no trend, apparently. But mostly I want to show positive trends. In acidity, we're seeing an increase in pH and an increase in alkalinity. Alkalinity is important for us because that's what we use for listing impairment. Uh, alkalinity doesn't necessarily kill uh, aquatic biota, but it definitely is an important factor for biological health. So we chose that because it tends to be very stable. As you can see from our, our graph line, it's a very stable parameter, and it is very important for biological health. So that's what we use for listing impairment. It's on demand. The primary precursors to acid rain, sulfur and nitrogen, are decreasing, as Rich showed pretty well. Uh, this particular case, branch isn't showing that much of a negative trend, but sulfur is definitely declining. And nitrate levels in that particular pond is, are quite low. We haven't talked about base cation depletion, but that is a, a, a phenomena that's occurring. Uh, we are losing uh, base cations, and it's particularly noted in our lakes. It does appear that it's actually very easily to measure in our, in our lakes. It's, it seems a little more difficult in soils, but it's very easy to measure in our lakes. And it does appear that this, there is a, a bit of a rebound in recent years. And with that, I think we'll see some neutralizing more going on, and uh, the lakes will continue to improve. Color, we're seeing an increase in color and DOC. This has also been something widely reported in the literature, and we're starting to see it as well in our lakes. Um, what I should note is that these aren't just trends we're seeing here in Little Vermont or, or in New England. These are really 
worldwide trends influenced primarily by legislative action to reduce emissions. It's really a, an amazing uh, success. Water clarity is sucky disc reading. This, we don't have a clear trend, but you know, 80 years of data, uh, excuse me, 20, 30 years of data does show a really nice pattern just as well. Little Pond is a classic example of an acid lake. Uh, it's clear and fishless. We're seeing the same patterns of reductions of sulfur and nitrogen, or excuse me, sulfur. Nitrogen's a, I wish I had 10 minutes just to talk about what's going on with nitrogen in our lakes. Nitrogen is a really interesting parameter, it, in particularly in these small lakes. Um, we're not exactly seeing nitrogen saturation, but we're certainly seeing nitrogen spiking going on in, in some of these really acid lakes. That nitrogen drives the pH to uh, quite low levels, and I think it's very climate related. Uh, it also strongly suggests that we do need to continue reducing emissions, which alluded to uh, uh, agricultural sources of ammonia. And, and I, I'm still very concerned about snowpack nitrogen, so we do need to keep working on that issue. Acid rain is definitely well on its, well on its way to being reduced, but it's definitely an issue that hasn't gone away. Uh, the same pattern is true that we saw on Branch uh, that we, we're seeing here on Little Pond. I wanted to show these different lakes because this is a classic Clearwater Lake. Born is a very colored uh, dystrophic lake. But whether you have an acid, an acid brown lake or a clear lake, the patterns are true. Uh, base cation depletion continues in Little Pond as we saw it in, in um, Branch. Theoretically, this is going to stabilize at some point, and I think we're starting to see it. Uh, the color issue is not as clear in little. Oh, well, I may not have time, but the lakes were chosen specifically as reference water bodies. We had high hopes for Forrester, but it was pretty close to a very large ski area, and over time, a, one of the roads were paved, and as you can see, uh, road salt does have a profound effect on lakes. Um, it seems to be stabilizing. My concern here is that road salt may have uh, an effect on recovery on this particular water body. On the other hand, there does seem to be a pattern of recovery, so we'll just keep our fingers crossed. The trends itself, I think this is really very important. We're seeing declines in sulfur. Uh, chloride. Chloride's a, a stable parameter, and again, it shouldn't be in high concentrations in these remote lakes anyways, because uh, it's just not an abundant, abundant mineral. And the base cations themselves are also de declining. Silica is mixed, and nitrate, which is uh, extremely important, we're seeing uh, weak or un a weaker, really undetermined trend on that one. And I think a lot of it is due to some of those factors we just discussed. Aluminum, also a very important parameter, but uh, because of its toxic effect, but you can see that in the, the toxic aluminum itself is declining, but, uh, ex excuse me, increasing. And but uh, we're getting a mix for the total. The Sentinel monitoring program is really interesting. Again, it was designed specifically to monitor climate change as signals in streams. How, how many minutes was that? Two minutes. Okay, we're going to wind this up then. What we're seeing driving a lot of these reference streams are, since they're not being affected by landscape disturbances, are flows themselves, uh, high flows. So in this case, what, I've, what we've done is we've plotted uh, over the over long term, flows versus density. And again, it's hard to say that, but what it basically is showing is that during high flow events, the density level decreases. No, there's no real change in richness over time, even with those flow events. These are reference water bodies, and one wouldn't expect them to change. If you want to change a benthic population, if you want to change a lake, 
you want to choose, you, all you need to do is landscape activities. If you leave them alone, you're not likely to get much of a change. These are what you end up with, with long-term monitoring, lots and lots of interesting biological results. And uh, this is the important stuff, comes down to, <laughs> down to this, but um, I'd be happy to talk to you a little bit more about that at the end. And I guess that's it. Thank you.